Funding for All Things Connecticut is made possible by our founding partner, People's United Bank. What know-how can do. Welcome to All Things Connecticut. I'm Diane Smith. Join us over the next half hour as we explore Connecticut from Long Island Sound to the Northwestern Hills. You won't need a compass, but Eric Clemens will as he takes us geocaching. Christina DeFranco explores the depths with scientists turning algae into energy. And Edwards Vicky gets us front row seats at the Kent Film Festival. Up first, we've heard a lot about Hollywood East and movies being made here, but one Oscar-winning animation company now calls Connecticut home. Blue Sky Studios turns out hits like Ice Age, Horton Hears a Who, and Robots from its headquarters in Greenwich. Maybe you're hungry. I know just the thing. The story takes place in the Ice Age, but it was shaped in Connecticut at Blue Sky Studios, a subsidiary of 20th Century Fox. In the third animated Ice Age film, Ray Romano and Queen Latifah are back as mammoths doing, Manny and idea. Ellie. Ellie, talk to the trunk. Scrat, the prehistoric squirrel rat, who was so popular in the earlier films, is taking on a bigger role this time and meeting his lady love, Scrate. In Greenwich, animators are hard at work on his story. Ice Age, Dawn of the Dinosaurs. The process begins when screenwriters turn over their script to storyboard artist Eric Favela. The script may say something, a, a very basic action. Scrat comes out from behind a tree and sniffs, and that may look something like, you know, I have the tree here, I arrange it how I think it should look in the movie. For a sequence in the film that may last only a few minutes, Eric draws some 500 panels. We can move things around if we need to or, or shrink. Jake Parker is one of the designers creating a look for the film. It's very angular. Uh, there's lots of sharp shapes, uh, uh, almost as if it's carved out of ice. His paintings, some done on the computer screen and some on paper, become the virtual sets for the film. Say we wanted another mammoth in the foreground here, standing on here. You know, I'll pick a brush and then I can actually uh, draw this mammoth here, block him in. You know, do a trunk coming out there and, you know, I'll work in that and, and just develop it. While the designers are working on the sets, Mike DeFeo is sculpting Scrat in polymer clay. When it's drawn out or you're just sort of speculating on what those poses might work, uh, you know, on paper, when you get them in 3D, you find a lot more that you can finesse it. This is our little baby dino. As you can see, he's just kind of like a big old puppy. He's got a giant head, <laughs> giant feet, and uh, even though he's got teeth that'll probably take your head off, he's looking very, very cute. But this is not claymation, where a physical character is placed on a real set and then moved slightly in each frame, as in stop-motion animation. Blue Sky Studios specializes in photorealistic, high-resolution, computer-generated character animation and rendering. On a live-action set, a cinematographer would lay down the marks for the actors, use the stand-ins for lighting, set up where the camera position would be, plan the lighting, follow production all the way through to make sure all the shots go according to plan, and that's basically what layout is. In computer-generated animation, there is no camera, no set, and no actual lighting. All of that is virtual and complicated. Rob showed us three versions of a sequence with Scrat and Scrate, each one more detailed than the last. It's all about camera placement, path of action. Everything gets final modeled, it gets final materialized. The effects start to move into place. 
Once that's done, all those elements come back together into one place and the shots get lit and then they're finaled. So this is what you're gonna see now are the master final lit shots with all, all elements in place. Brian Keane says the process of making an Ice Age film takes about three and a half years versus a live action film which might be shot in six months. For a 90 minute movie at 24 frames a second, that's approximately 130,000 frames of individual art that have to be created and digitized and, and brought to life and, and rendered with our proprietary software. If you were to fire a, a ray of light from a light source it calculates how many different points of intersection that ray of light will hit. It might be the way it would bounce within a character's hair to the way it would reflect and, and bounce and move through water. Some of it would deflect into the water, some of it would bounce off the water. It's the visual representation of a world that exists only in the computer. The final version right here, which I'll show you first. Jim Bresnahan has been an animator for 14 years. You know, in animation, what we like to do is take those little moments where there are pauses and where actually not a lot is happening um, and, and just try to sell, like, perhaps a little bit of a, a thought process with the eye shifts and things of that nature. He manipulates Scrat with a computer device called a picker that allows him to control any part of Scrat's anatomy. When he descends, his eyeballs stretch out, and then when he stops, they squash, and that's an animation principle called Squash and stretch, you may have heard of. Started way back with Disney, but we try to do that in uh, 3D animation wherever we can. We, we really follow the old principles of animation. But in this new medium, math counts. So we can tell it, you know, frame 210 here, it was, you know, the value was 0.6. Meaning Scrat's eyelid was about half closed. Here's the scene as it appears in the film. In 10 years, Blue Sky has expanded from 50 people to nearly 350. The need for a building that could house them all on one floor led them from Westchester to Connecticut. That and... Very, very extraordinarily aggressive tax credit program that um, is, is one of the best in the nation. Their job is to come to work every day and want to make someone happy, cry, make them laugh and make them forget about what it is that, you know, might be troubling them in a particular day to just go to the movie and have a good time. <laughs> that passion is the thing that I'm the most proud of. A passion for animation. <laughs> At Blue Sky Studios, it's Positively Connecticut. <laughs> Next, we visit another Connecticut hotspot for movie makers. In our Spotlight on the Arts, Ed Wersbicki reports from the annual Kent Film Festival. While most of the world would hardly know it, the Kent Film Festival has become quite the local happening. Social, spirited, and almost glamorous. But to get some real perspective, well, that requires an exterior shot and jump cut. A lot of young people are using computers and making films, and you know, they, there's this great platform for that. So I, I said to Patrice, you know, it would be great to have like a, a festival where they can show their work. It would be like a gallery for filmmakers, young filmmakers. So we put posters up all over the towns and, and put we, like little in the free, you know, part of the newspapers, the event section, you know, we want your movie. Yeah. They started coming yeah. in. This year, the festival's fourth season, a total of 110 films were screened, including shorts, documentaries, student films, and feature-length movies, all part of the four-day event that combines education and entertainment. We want to become a film school. We're going to start with just workshops and you know do workshops with, for people of all ages. Some people might not even know what you get out of a film festival. So we have a facts and how-to. Go to a film festival on our website. 
basically, it's going to the movies, but you get to see things you would never see, and then you might be able to meet the filmmaker. I get hired on various jobs to do uh, archival research or production coordination. Or like Ilana Sol, who traveled here from the West Coast. On Paper Wings, five years in the making, is one of several important documentaries by female directors featured at this year's festival. あの、これはアメリカ本土を攻撃するための日本の日本軍の秘密兵器であるというような説明を受けました。ですから、ここです。こういう作業をしてるっていうことは一切もう家庭に帰ってもあのお友達にもあの話したらいけませんというようなそうい
Normally it'll just give you like a general area of it, but you have to do a little searching sometimes. All this came about when federal restrictions on civilian GPS systems were lifted back in 2001. Today, a personal GPS system can take you within 10 feet of a destination. Just go online, find the latest cache locations, input the coordinates, and it's time to go on the hunt. The Peckman's target today is Hopbrook Lake. Good afternoon. Welcome to Hopbrook Lake. Thanks. How are you today? Good. How are you? Excellent. We're here for the geocaches? Okay, I'll let you in and hope you have some fun today. Thanks. Now, geocachers don't look for serious treasure. Many times, the prize is a simple trinket in a container, much like the ones the Peckmans used. One rule, however, take a prize, leave a prize of greater or equal value. The thrill for most cachers is in the journey. You can make the hunt as simple as a flat terrain walk or as difficult as a deep water dive or even a rock climb. Only 300 feet. So if you're thinking about getting into geocaching, there are over 3,000 available in our state alone. 750,000 active caches worldwide in over 83 countries. So you've got your GPS coordinates. You're within smelling distance of your prize. However, finding that little gem might be a bit more difficult than you'd expect. Straight ahead. I look for creative places. A lot of uh, places tend to be rock walls and ends of logs and tree stumps and things like that, uh, which are great. But um, you could be creative with containers. You can uh, mask them. You can camouflage them. to the left. Okay, it's only 20 feet away. Let's find it. Dennis, did you find anything? No, not yet. This looks like a good spot. Hey, Carolyn, you found it. All right. Mission accomplished. There you go. I want to sign in. Get a pencil. Yes, because the Peckmans are experienced cashers, they can celebrate a family victory when you and I might still be looking. They sign the logbook as proof of their expertise, and that's what geocaching is all about. All right. Did you guys want to trade anything, or uh, no, not today? No. Not all right. Today. All right, let's put it back where we found it then. That's a lot of fun because we go to places, a lot of places that we would never go to, uh, geocaching brings us to. Um, a lot of parks like this. Uh, we might not come if it wasn't for the geocaches in here. Uh, we go to Sleepin' Giant State Park, there's a bunch of them in there. All the state parks, most of them have a geocache in them, if not multiple. So it can go bring you a lot of places. It's a great way to have family fun, family bonding time, be outdoors, get some exercise, and uh, just enjoy nature. Geocaching, it could bring out the treasure hunter in all of us. With your Inside Out Report, I'm Eric Clemens. Oil supplies may eventually run out, but algae keeps on growing and growing. So scientists at the University of New Haven are working on turning it into fuel. Treading Lightly reporter Christina DeFranco heads out onto Long Island Sound to learn more. A morning at sea for University of New Haven's Dr. Carmela Cuomo and her budding biologists. You got it, Leslie. Drop it straight off the side. Let it fill with water. Yeah, I want to get it. This expedition will confound you fishing enthusiasts because the prized catch is something you really can't see. Okay. Okay. I'm hoping to get more algae than last time. So They're after algae, which could become Connecticut's next cash crop. 
we're looking at different types of algae as um, potential biofuel feedstock. So basically, what's pulled from the sound could someday be grown on local algae farms and then turned into a fuel that would power your car. Dr. Cuomo and crew are trawling for two different kinds of algae. Here in Black Rock Harbor, they're after phytoplankton, microscopic single-cell algae. But in New Haven Harbor, they're after macroalgae. That's the stuff you can see. We know it as seaweed. So we're looking to see which species in Long Island Sound may have the highest lipid content and make them therefore um, ideal biofuel feedstocks. A lipid is a fat, so the plumpest specimens will produce the most oil. These fine mesh nets skim just below the surface, picking up the invisible specimens and a few extras. These are small pieces of macroalgae, which were just drifting. A lot of that in there are all the zooplankton, the animals that are moving. And you got a little bit of green on the bottom there, ever so little. Justin, did you get more? Because I am not happy with this toe. Along for the ride, students from Bridgeport's Regional Vocational Aquaculture School. They're a vital part of this research experiment. And you can see the vessel position. So the kids are really getting involved in the idea of, of global fuel resources. Uh, you know, what kind of sources are we going to come with in the future? Are you rooting for anyone in particular? Uh, yeah, I am. I am. Um, like, like all moms, you love them equally but differently. So um, I, there's actually one macroalgae that I have high hopes for. Again, those macroalgae? Seaweed. They're analyzed and weighed here at the Sound School in New Haven by students, of course. And we're just trying to take care of it and control the amount of light it receives and the nutrients and the water temperature and try to make it grow as best it can. This whole experiment started when Dr. Cuomo was down here with her students from the university and she started looking around and said, gee, all this algae. Maybe I could get a lipid out of it. The main problem with biofuels is finding a, a, a renewable local feedstock. So Dr. Cuomo's interest in algae as a potential biofuel makes perfect sense when you consider how abundant seaweed is along the shoreline and in the sound. There are people throughout the nation looking at local local plants, local algae, local freshwater algae, local marine algae to see if in every state they can find more or less their own particular feed crop. Those samples of microscopic algae collected from the sound brought into the lab at the sound school where they're also pumped up. You're getting them to a point where you can actually measure their lipid content. Yeah, so and there's a lot of nutrients that we're adding uh, and they're soaking up all the nutrients, absorbing it. The algae start out in these beakers as they grow, they're moved into bigger containers until they're finally transferred into these giant tanks. Once the tanks are drained and the super algae samples are scraped out, they're sent over here to University of New Haven's organic chemistry lab for the moment of truth. Our challenge is to simply get high quality numbers on the amount of oil in the amount of algae so that the biologists can have an idea of which species are most productive. And so we get this frozen algae, you can still see the ice on it. Once it's dried out, oil is extracted. And this sample came from one of these. And once we take the oil, I mean, we can analyze it. And so if you'll start up the GC mass spec. And that would be the mass spectrum of C16, right? Yep. The nice thing about the algae is it has the potential to be highly successful because it has a lot of oil content. Luzik thinks algae may even be more oil rich than the last specimens he analyzed, acorns. Once you take the nut meat to make the samples easy to process, we grind them up, we just use a blender, and we get a powder out of it. And once we get the powder... Oil is extracted through this device. And we get out oil. And this is from about five pounds of acorns. It will give us a substantial amount of acorn oil. And the oil can then be processed into fatty acid methyl esters, which is known as biodiesel. And is that what could ultimately go in your car? Yes, this could go into a diesel burning engine. As far as Dr. Cuomo is concerned, we're only about five to 10 years away from gassing up on fuel derived from acorns or algae, or whatever crop is native to the state you're traveling. Go through Ohio and maybe run on, you know, corn ethanol and run through Colorado and you're on switchgrass. 
and you go out to California and you're on kelp. For Treading Lightly, I'm Christina DeFranco. Finally, we close with a photo essay by Paul Smith that captures Connecticut. Her name's not Grandma Moses, but this grandmother from New Britain has the same passion for painting. I'm Diane Smith. Join us again next week, and be sure to check us out on the web at cptv.org, keywords, all things Connecticut. <laughs>"...a 62-year-old grandma. I like to draw and I like things that are kind of funky. I just draw because I love to draw. Everyone should have art in their house that they like. Funding for All Things Connecticut is made possible by our founding partner, People's United Bank. What know-how can do.